Pull this up here a little bit. I may have to use it to hit Jim Parsons over the head for that introduction. <laughs> Let me just start by saying it's great to be here. And uh, I represent the greatest district in all of Arkansas. Nowhere do you have events like this across the state that are so well attended and so, so uh, supported as, as we see here in Bella Vista. Nowhere do we see so many people stand up who have served, uh, families who have supported those who've served. Uh, it is such an honor to represent you in Little Rock. Uh, let me just also say uh, a couple of things here. This, uh, you know, I know Jim put a lot of work in this and, and you can tell. I want to start with Leonard Isaacs and the work he did on this wall. You know, I was in the house 20 years ago. That tells you how long before this wall ever existed. And he would call me and, and try to get funds allocated for this project from the state. And you know, there's been a lot of scandal and controversy over what the state calls general improvement funds, but of all the dollars we've ever spent, I think dollars helping projects like this are absolutely the best, some of the best use of our tax dollars. And I so appreciate his leadership in helping us uh, get that done. I got to visit with Mr. Whitford over here, and he said, I, you know, he was in the Army Air Corps, which for those of you who know, was the pre pre predecessor to the Air Force. And uh, when they said they were going to do the five services, he said, well, I don't have a service in Alabama. I said, no, you're in my service. You're my dad. You're the service that I came from. And it's such an honor to get to visit with people like him who, who uh, uh, went across the Pacific and kept us free in one of the uh, most vicious conflicts our nation's ever faced. It. I'd also like to say thanks to uh, Lois and the, and the band over here. Just absolutely incredible. Can we give them a hand for the music and the job that they did. I so appreciate the work that went into preparing for that and the time you take to make that happen. So so thank you and to, to Phyllis for the national anthem. It was just beautiful. It's just a great service and a great day to come here and uh, not celebrate, but to remember and memorialize those who paid the ultimate price. Uh, more than any other speech, when I am asked to speak at a Memorial Day speech, I spend some time thinking about it because there's a lot of responsibility that comes with a group and a gathering like this. And that is not to make it about ourselves, not to make it about picnics and barbecues, and not to even make it about fellow uh, brothers and sisters in arms that are still here and are still living. But it's to make it about those who didn't come home, those who suited up and said goodbye to their family, and got on a bus or got on a plane or got on a train and came back with a flag uh, to be buried or, or buried overseas. That's what it's about and that's what I want this discussion to be about today. So I want to talk to you just a couple minutes about a couple people and it's hard, how do you, how do you decide who you're going to talk about when we've had over 1.4 million Americans lay down their lives since the beginning of this country? Think about that. 1.4 million have left and not come home. So who do you, who do you pick? You can't pick anyone uh, that defines them all because they came from every state, they, come, they came from every background, every way of life. But I wanna talk about a couple that are close to here, close to home, close to Arkansas, because I think they symbolize what all of us think about when we think of those that we know that, that paid the ultimate price. Uh, let me start with a young kid from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Most of you all know where Jonesboro is on the northeast corner of the state. This kid was uh, named Harold Eugene Sellers. Uh, Harold Eugene Sellers was an incredible athlete at Jonesboro High School, starred in both baseball and football and was actually offered a scholarship to go play football at the University of Arkansas. But way back in 1943, he knew his nation was at war and he volunteered to go and serve. He chose the 101st Airborne Division. Those of you that are in the Army and those of us that work with the Army know one of the most prestigious historic units in the military and, comp and, and carries out some of the most dangerous missions and still does today and certainly did back in World War II. But not only did he choose to be a paratrooper in the 101st Airborne, but he also volunteered to be a pathfinder. One of the most dangerous missions in the most dangerous units uh, 
still today. And what a Pathfinder does is jump out before the rest of the crew to go down and mark the landing zones so that people land in safe areas and not where the enemy is or not where there's trees or not where there's lakes where they could drown. It's a very dangerous mission because the technology they had to jump then was not like we have today with GPS and all the precision and all the things that we can do. I mean, they were. we think we're in about the right area, jump out and give it a go. Think about the courage it takes to jump out over enemy territory, not knowing what's below except a lot of bad guys, not knowing if you're going to hit the trees or hit the city or hit the water, and then go find safe areas for your people to land and to jump. That's what this 20-year-old kid from Jonesboro, Arkansas chose to do uh, rather than go play football at the University of Arkansas Razorbacks, which nobody would have faulted him for. So he jumped in on June the 6th, just after midnight. And history tells us, and if you go to Normandy today, you'll see this story tell, told in the visitor center there at Normandy. He was probably the second to die. Because what happened to Gene Sellers is he jumped in, and what happens in a lot of cases, particularly in places that are wooded like the areas of France where they were jumping, he got hung up in a tree. He was, he was a victim of what he was trying to prevent happen to his fellow paratroopers. And as he was struggling to get out of the tree, the Germans heard him, and they came and machine gunned him as he hung there in a parachute. He never came back to play football. He never came back to have a family. He stayed there and is buried there today. <clears throat> I want to clarify something that Jim said. You know, my, my military career, I was active duty for eight years. You all spent a lot of money teaching me to fly airplanes, and I flew F-15s and intercepted Russians. But I, I was not, like some of these Army and Marines and guys, I was not in country in Iraq and Afghanistan. When I joined the Guard, I joined the command element, and I did most of the controlling from Al Udeed Air Base in Qatar. So we controlled the air war in Iraq and Afghanistan, but uh, the missions that were getting flown over those countries were done by people like my son, who I got to watch fly into Syria and do some airstrikes. But as I was there, I got to learn about another neighbor of ours, 